Welcome clients and guests. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Patrick Malcolm. I'm a senior partner at GFM Wealth. Uh, nice to be uh, catching up with everyone this morning or presenting to everyone this morning with a little bit of good news over the weekend. Can't help but feel that over the last two webinars, I think I've been a little bit of a curse. I think the last two times I've, I've presented, I've been talking about lockdowns and these sorts of things. So we hope that everyone's doing well and uh, coping as well as can be. And again, it's nice to have um, a little bit more freedom um, coming up. We're very fortunate this morning. Uh, we've got three guests with us this morning, which I think may be a first. Um, so our special guests this morning are Mark Freeman, Kieran Kennedy, and Jeff Driver from AFIC and Mirabuka. I'll introduce each of those guys um, in a moment. Um, as always, uh, when we present, we need to um, go through our disclaimer. And as always, uh, when we've got... Uh, when we are presenting, we've got our disclaimer and we've got Affix disclaimer in our moment. So um, first and foremost, for everyone that's joining us today, you just need to understand that this is general advice in nature. It's not specific to your circumstances. If you want advice that's particular to you, please call our office and speak with one of our um, financial planners. So um, there's the Affix disclaimer as well. Um, so before um, we start, I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to Affix. Um, so AFIC, which many of our guests and clients would have heard of, is the largest listed investment company in Australia with a market capitalisation of over $10 billion. And just to give people a sense of the size of AFIC, I'm going to give you some names of some companies that have market capitalisations of $10 billion. Qantas has a market capitalisation of $11 billion, obviously been through some difficult times recently. Medibank Private has a market capitalisation of $10 billion. Seek who many people would have heard of, has a market capitalisation of $11 billion. And ComputerShare, which is truly a global business, has a market capitalisation of $11 billion. So you're getting a sense of the size of AFIC. Now, I'm not sure whether this makes me feel young or old, but AFIC's been investing in equity since 1928. So it's not too far off having a 100-year track record. Um, the experienced team manages the portfolio with a long-term lens aiming to provide shareholders with attractive investment returns through access to a growing stream of fully frank dividends and growth in capital invested. Believe it or not, there's 160,000 shareholders invested in, across Australia in AFIC, which is quite incredible. Just to give people a sense of how AFIC has performed, one of the problems with when dealing with an investment that's been going for almost 100 years is our software just doesn't go back that far. But if we go back to the 31st of March, 2000, since that point in time, AFIC's produced a compound return of 10.5% per annum and the market's produced a return of 8.4% per annum. Now, people would know from previous webinars that I um, much have a preference to look at the cumulative return rather than the annual compound, annual compound return. That's 764% versus 463% for the market over that period of time. So it's beaten cumulatively the market by 300%. And we look at the volatility over the last 15 years as measured by standard deviation, it's uh, actually done it with 8% less. So um, that's a little bit of a spill on, on AFIC. We'll talk about Mirabuka a little bit later when we speak to Kieran. So first up is um, Jeff. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. That's great. Now, just to start with, um, given that we're talking about listed investment companies, um, could you just explain for the benefit of our clients and guests how AFIC and Mirabuka actually work as listed investment companies? Yeah, so as the name suggests, uh, listed investment companies are listed on the, on the exchange, on the ASX. So from that perspective, just like any other company that you would buy, as you mentioned before, like Qantas or Medibank Private, they are listed there and you can, uh, you can buy those shares. They're obviously um, easily trade tradable uh, given the size of both of the funds that we have, all four funds that we have. And I guess they also come under the corporate governance structure and disclosure structure of the ASX listing. So there's some comfort for shareholders there that, in fact, there's quite a strong reg regulatory regime around how these companies operate. And we obviously have boards of directors, independent uh, directors who sit over the top of them who actually not only participate, I guess, in the, the governance process, but also in the investment process, um, which props Mark that we'll talk about a bit later on. Um, more importantly, from, a, from an investment perspective, they are closed end. So in a sense, there's a set amount of capital that we have to invest and we, which we can control. So investment decisions are not 
uh, dicta dictated by the inflows and outflows of funds as per, say, an open-ended trust. So we can be patient investors. We are very much long-term investors, as you obviously talked about earlier on. So quite often, we use negative market sentiment to, um, to buy more stock than the companies that we like. We have control, in fact, over the, the, when we raise capital. So in a sense, we only raise capital, make the funds look to make the funds bigger when we think there's appropriate investment opportunities uh, in place. And we do that through share purchase plans and those sorts of things. Our funds are internally managed, so they're not like some of the newer listed investment companies that have come to the market. So they don't really have an external fund manager running an external business off the back of this, charging 1% fee. So in AFIC's case, the management expense ratio is 0.14%, so very, very low, as low as you would get with an ETF, probably even lower. And Mirror Book is very low also for a, for a mid-small cap fund as 0.5%. So... In a sense, both the structure and the way we manage the, the companies, uh, we think, uh, are very much aligned with the interests of shareholders. Thanks for that, Jeff. Now, I'm going to introduce Mark. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Mark. Patrick. Now, for the benefit of all our guests, Mark and I were rather excited over the weekend because we can both get back to our golf club and plus start playing golf uh, from the announcement this weekend. So we're, we're both celebrating that. Um, I guess the most important thing, Mark, um, when running a portfolio like AFIC, it's really important to pick out good quality investments. And just for the benefit of our clients and guests, can you explain the process that you go through at AFIC in terms of picking out investments for the portfolio? Sure. And and uh, as a long-term investor, we want to be in businesses that we can hold for the long term and enjoy the uh, compounding returns you get from those companies. And that therefore contributes to having very low turnover and a very tax efficient um, investment structure. So I think our turnover has been averaging something like five or 6%, so in incredibly low. And so therefore we want a process that can identify what are the businesses that we can hold for the long term. Um, and from that, as, as uh, pointed out, we're, we're an investor in businesses. We're not a trader of share prices. And so some of the things we look for, we've got a, um, a process where we, um, assess the business um, on quality. We, we talk about we're quality first. Um, so we want quality companies. And then we want to find all those quality companies, the ones that we think can grow because we want growing dividends over time. And then we look to buy them when we see value. So a couple of the factors we consider is um, the competitive position of a business. So the uniqueness of assets. So we look for companies that have a leadership position in the markets they operate. We want businesses that then are going to be around for the long term. And so we assess the sustainability of that business and ESG sort of um, gets really built into that. Um, so we want their a business's competitive advantage to be around for a long time. And we you want companies that um, we talk about independence. So companies that don't have too many sort of significant external factors that can weigh on the business, such as a government suddenly making a decision that can disrupt the business or a powerful supplier or a powerful customer. And so those three components are really, um, a lot of people may have heard of Porter's model. Um, it's another way of looking at Porter's model about comp sustainable competitive advantage. The next three then are sort of other factors that we assess as being important is the people that run the business is really important. We talk about an owner-driver model. We like companies that you have a founder-led business or a business that is run like it's founder-led or a sense of proprietorship. And we find those companies where they're exceptionally well-run. Uh, again, you put those into a great industry structure. Um, we've had great success with that. And then we, we want businesses. We prefer businesses that have more consistent earnings flows and very strong balance sheets. Um, a poor balance sheet is, is a factor that often blows up companies. So we want to avoid companies that have too much debt. Understood. Now, you introduced the concept of ESG before their mark. Um, it's very topical at the moment and yep. continues to be increasingly more topical, which we think is a good thing. Hmm. Um, obviously, running a portfolio of $10 billion, you have to be conscious of, of this. How do you, what's your view on ESG and how do you incorporate it into the, the ethic? Portfolio yeah, well, when you're picking stocks. Yeah, look, it's become a like a, a, a it's something we have to talk about. But in fact, I mean, I've been involved with the 
these funds for 27 years. And in fact, ESG has been a part of our process. We just, we never called it ESG from the day I joined. Um, governance factors was something I got taught on day one. Who's on the board? How are they running the company? Are they running it for shareholders? Um, are they making the right governance decisions? And when we think about social factors, um, we've never invested in pure play gambling stocks. Um, but we, we don't like that. We feel people can make up their own mind about that. So social issues, we do think about that. And then things like environmental issues, being a long-term investor, um, where I talked about sustainability has been one of our key factors. If we think our businesses have, are having issues because of longer-term environmental impacts, they're not doing the right thing, we think that ultimately impacts the business and affects how we assess the sustainability of the model. And, and therefore, it affects how we rate the company. So it's actually embedded in the way we go about analysing companies, um, but we just have to call it out a bit more um, in terms of the way we think and look, and look at it. And, and I've sort of highlighted on this slide, you know, things like engagement with companies on all those factors. You know, we're very active speaking to the CEOs of the companies we invest in, um, often with directors and the chairs of companies. And, you know, if we think there are issues out there affecting the quality of the companies on any of those factors, we raise it with them um, and expect them to address it. It's interesting because there's a little bit, it's semantics here in terms of what's most important in terms of the E, the S and the G, and they're all important, Mark. But do you feel having a background or a long-term background in the G, the governance makes it easier to, to deal with the issues around the environmental and social? Oh, look, 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 I think they're all important. It depends on the on the business, but but you know, on that governance, yeah, yeah, I, I think having that that sense of interacting with the business, um, we're not ones that sort of when you see a problem. A great example of that would be with Rio. Um, obviously, some really poor behaviours over in Western Australia over the last couple of years. But we don't sort of then dump the stock and move on. We don't think that's the right approach. What we do is engage with the company. And, because we're the shareholders, they're our assets. Um, we want to stay our owner of the great iron or assets, but we just want them to be run properly. So if there's something wrong, rather than us moving on as shareholders, we sort of put a view, we think the management should move on and get someone decent in to run our business for our shareholders. And in fact, that's what the outcome of that was. And so that's an example of us engaging with a company on ESG issues and getting an outcome where we stay an investor in Rio and the great iron ore assets, but get some people in there who actually will um, respect them a bit more. Understood. Now, we're going to um, we're going to embellish a little bit here. Mark, we've picked out two of the better performers that have been in the AFIC portfolios for a long time. Um, two businesses that not everyone would be perfectly familiar with in ARB and, and ResMed, maybe ResMed may be a little bit better well-known. Can you talk us through each of these stocks, Mark, how they've been in the portfolio, what you like about the businesses and yep. all that? Yeah, Pat, so I'll get Kieran perhaps to start on. I'll, I'll just jump in and add a few more comments along the way. Sure, Mark. Good morning, Patrick, and good morning, Thanks, everyone. Kieran. So perhaps just starting with ARB, um, so to describe the business first, so um, they're a, becoming a global leader effectively in accessorising four-wheel drive vehicles. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful story of uh, founders, founding families still being involved. Uh, this company was listed in the mid-1980s and has been a spectacular performer ever since. And really, like a lot of these businesses, you, you start from a sort of pretty simple premise of what they do, but it's what makes them special beneath that is the long-term vision and the way they really reinvest profits in innovation in this case. So they have you know, world-leading products in that field. There's always people trying to copy their products, but when you get that reputation for quality and innovation in this area and you keep reinvesting, they've just been really good at staying ahead of the pack. Um, and interestingly, I guess the other trend that's been really supportive for them is you know, the increased proportion of uh, four-wheel drive vehicles on the roads. You know, you see it through tradies, um, people for recreational purposes, touring, you know, you've seen that in Australia over a long period of time, but it's a, it's a global trend as well. Um, and we're seeing ARB's ability to, to take that great reputation they've got in Australia and really put it on the world stage um, into some much larger global markets is, is really what's getting people excited at the moment. Interesting, Kieran. And that retracement in the share price from sort of, is, is, that, is that 
COVID sort of looks like the share price sort of halved during that period of time. Is that right? Yeah, so they, they went through a period where growth flattened out a bit, Patrick, and it's because of its quality, it's, it's never a stock that's kind of cheap in the market, but I think people just lost a bit of patience. And then you saw when COVID initially hit, uh, there was a big cancellation of orders um, because, you know, there's so much uncertainty last March when it initially hit. What we've seen since is when things started to emerge out of COVID and people started to deal with the reality of the situation we're in, I guess overseas travels off. Um, so the the desire to get out and see in parts of Australia where you can get out and see, you know, regional Australia and, and still have a break has actually been a really good trend. So, travel overseas at the moment. So we're seeing lots of people buying caravans and investing in four wheel drives <laughs> to travel around Australia. Absolutely. So this has been one of the most, I mean, it's been a fascinating period, COVID. This has been one of the most remarkable in that they had a, a collapse in orders initially and then a surge in orders. So they were laying off workers and, and looking to preserve the business. And then within six months, hiring all those workers back and, and more to, to keep up with demand. And if you don't mind me asking, that sort of 18 month period, how have you guys sort of traded the stock? Have you been long term holders? Did you add to it when it was weak? Have you been skimming from it as it's as it sort of appreciated in value or have you just sort of let it run? No, we've been been long term holders, Patrick. So we did do some good buying sort of around the eighteen to twenty dollar mark pre COVID, um, which really built our position up in AFIC. Um, obviously, saw the volatility when COVID hit, but kept the long term perspective and then have enjoyed the, the rebound since. Good stuff. Now, ResMed is that Mark or, or Kieran? I'll I'll I'll, I'll start, Mark, and, and jump in if there's anything you want to add. So, now, can you tell us about the business because um, if, if there are a few clients that understand the technology, Kieran, um, yeah. but just maybe a little bit of background in terms of, of what it actually does. Yeah, sure. So um, like a lot of these healthcare businesses, there's the the machine and then the consumable that comes with it. So in this case, you know, for people suffering from sleep apnea and uh, sleep issues, which there is a, a large number and growing number of people around the world that are, uh, they, they provide that continuous airflow um, so people get a better night's sleep, which has a lot of health benefits. So both the machine, the, the CPAP device, and then the mask that people wear um, overnight. And again, the backstory here is really interesting, Patrick. I mean, we, we were caught up with Mick Farrell, the CEO, who's the son of the founder, who's still on the board. And interestingly, he was telling the story about how this business um, was in Baxter Healthcare back in the 1980s, and it was deemed non-core. They, they felt they had other things to invest in. So Peter Farrell thought there was an opportunity um, and, and basically took the business out of that larger organisation and again, that, that process of reinvestment, taking a long-term view, you know, uh, managing the business the way we like has seen exceptional growth over that period of time to the extent where this is now a company like, with a capitalization over $30 billion and is actually grown now to be the same size as Baxter Healthcare, you know, the company that shunned them all those years ago. Just Funny how that happens sometimes, isn't it? When it gets its own sort of air to breathe, pardon the pun. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And you, the, the, I guess the other parallel here is you'll see coming through from that is, you know, the backstory about those people is interesting to hear, but it's also really important because when you're looking for exceptional businesses, you know, finding those people that it's their life's work, it's their obsession, you just get that extra focus, that extra passion um, and that long-term perspective that they have to take because that's what they're interested in. And that they're the ones that we really get, gravitate to um, where we can in, in the portfolios. Understood. So now, when you when you added this back in 2013, how was the business? Was it considered somewhat speculative at the time, or, or, or how was it viewed in the wider market when when you were sort of first including it in portfolios? No, look, um, quality. The, the quality has never been an issue of it. Um, I think the chart really, when you go back that far, it just shows you the benefit of um, compound returns. I mean, to be honest, if you'd ran a chart from 2000 to 2013, it still would have been pretty good, or really good. Um, so I guess when you grow from a, a tiny company in the 1980s to something in the 30s billion dollars of market capitalization, they haven't really raised much money along the way. So it's been all about reinvesting profits. You know, these are the sorts of charts you can produce when you go back over a long time frame. Yeah, it's a good looking uh, chart. And I think yeah, the other so thing, Patrick, is yep, that, on, um, that the market and investors usually 
um, don't understand, but us being a long-term investor, you use your experience, is that when you put, uh, find a company that has established a leadership position and there's still a long runway of growth, you actually enjoy great earnings growth. It's, it's not a five-year or a 10-year or a 15. It's usually a 20 to 25-year story. And therefore, most people's views of valuations, people tend to look at some of these stocks and see high P's and say it's too expensive. And that's because they're not understanding that when you find these companies, they will grow for 25 years. And yeah. often what seems like a high PE is actually not really a high PE. It's usually pretty good value. But as Kieran's talked through, when you go back to our process, the similarities between these, they're very different businesses but the investment characteristics are very similar, i.e. they both have a leadership position in their markets, both produce very high return on capital and return on equity, which is really important to us. Both reinvest heavily in the business. They have that owner driver, um, Kieran, um, the CEO of ARB um, and his brother. It's their business. Um, they're running it. Um, um, they have both kept incredibly strong balance sheets. Um, we talked about that. And both have significant growth opportunity because they're both global businesses. So different companies, but very similar characteristics. We look for characteristics that our experience tells us will lead to a good investment. Find them and then make sure you invest them and then hold them for the long term. Yeah, it's interesting. You picked out two businesses, one that sort of deals with cars and one that deals with sleep apnea, but you're able to sort of link the commonality in terms yep. of good quality investments. I'm keen to sort of know, recently the share price has been quite strong off the back of Philips having some issues with, with their device. Um, how, have you guys, again, long-term holders sort of haven't skimmed or sort of how do you view the share price at current levels? No, look, and, um, it's a good question, Patrick. And again, the similarities in both. It, we just find it, and going to what Mark was just saying then, we just continually focus on what does this valuation look like on a five to 10 year perspective. And, you know, and if you're prepared then to say, Maybe they've had too good time of it and, you know, there's potential risk on a short-term view and you're prepared to wear that, then you get the benefits of the long-term perspective. So we haven't trimmed in either of these stocks. Um, and we think, I mean, while there is probably some short-term benefit from the Phillips recall, um, we think it will cement a larger market share for ResMed for the long-term too. So we do see structural benefit in that. So we're equally as convinced on it on a five to 10 year view as we were before. Interesting. Now, just to sort of highlight the um, performance metrics for um, AFI, quite impressive, um, beating the index over one, three, and five, and 10-year returns, and comprehensively since um, that other period of time that I put in almost 20 years ago. Um, and what most what impresses us too is the ability to, to generate that outperformance while taking on a lower level of risk than the index, um, which is impressive. Also, to sort of highlight the performance, Mark, which, which you must be excited by in terms of the app performance in really four very different investment phases when we sort of break them into six-month periods. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, well, look, um, I just say it won't always be like that. We put a caveat around that. Of course, so, of course. You know, we, we do have to understand, you know, the, the markets go in cycles and the movement within sectors in the market goes through cycles and you you know the last thing you want to try and do is you know keep changing your style as styles move in markets so but you know look it has been clearly been pleasing um but the challenge for us always is to keep looking forward and say well you know where do we go next where do we make adjustments to the portfolio um from here but um, as you pointed out from the previous slide you know to, to achieve those to me to achieve those returns with incredibly low volatility. The other thing too is that we've had a very consistent dividend flow. Um, we build up reserves along the way, often they, through a takeover, and then we use those reserves um, when we have um, dislocations in the market, like we had um, through COVID, all the companies we invest in cut their dividends. We could then dip into the reserves and keep our dividends going. So we've had a much more consistent dividend flow than the index. Understood. Now, can you talk to us? Um, I know we pointed out before that there hasn't been much movement with ARB and, and ResMed, which is interesting to hear given the strength in the share prices, Mark. But can you talk about some recent transactions in the portfolio? Pick out a few here that we've got highlighted on the slide. Yeah. And once again, I think I'll let Kieran start and then I'll jump in at the end. 
Yeah, perhaps. Um, so I'll start with the the, the purchaser side, Patrick. Um, yep. There's a couple of um, probably new names to people that we think are really interesting. So perhaps starting with with Pexa, which was a pretty high profile recent um, IPO. So so Pexa is is now the dominant um, player in terms of settling mortgages. So both through the purchase of a home or if you remortgage your home, you probably don't know that's being used in the background when you go through that process. Um, the governments around Australia have mandated um, to a large degree that the exchange of documents in, in a settlement of a mortgage now has to happen electronically. And this is the exchange, much like the Australian Stock Exchange that, that operates in the background to, to facilitate that. So that's a really good asset. We think that's an asset that will be doing the same thing many, many, many decades from now, which is always a great starting point. Um, people obviously recognise the quality of that at IPO, so it's not the sort of stock you're going to get cheaply. But what we think is really interesting is Australia is actually world leading um, in, I guess, in comparative countries around the world in this development. So the UK, for instance, are, are years and years behind and, and PEX are over there now looking to start the same process, starting with the banks and starting to really get the, the, the same um, system in place over there, which... You know, it could be very exciting on a on a you know ten to twenty year view for this company. So we, we saw the asset, we know the asset well, and just thought this suits our quality focus, and um, therefore let, let's put it in the portfolio and um, and look, look to add more as as they tick the boxes um, over time. That's an interesting one, and maybe one of the additions to existing holdings holdings, Kieran. Yeah, so perhaps Transurban is an interesting one because um, it's been a, in the portfolio for a long time. We, we think the assets are fantastic, you know, the income that, that comes from that. And that, obviously that's an important part of, of ethic. You know, we, we want good, you know, really high growing companies for the growth side of the portfolio, but we want to balance that with the income to pay out that distribution to our shareholders. And I guess what we really like about Transurban is that the, the road networks they now have in the cities they're focused on you know, have a really strong presence. And as those cities grow, there's always going to be the need to develop expansions and add-ons to that network over time. And now that consumers are used to paying tolls and it's not such a political issue, um, the ability for Transurban to be the best source of funding for those opportunities to enable those cities to grow just gives you a really good opportunity to reinvest in, a, in an area where others aren't throwing money at it because they can't replicate that same position that Transurban has in those cities. So, you know, we think that gives it a really good duration of just really solid returns and a, and a core position in the portfolio. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Most of our clients talk about Transurban. There's normally a swear word before it or afterwards because <laughs> they're conscious of how much they pay for tolls. Mm. Can and I just ask Mark just, or just, I'll just quickly, Patrick, I'll just oh, sort of mention yep. on that. I mean, we won't go into all the details, but it's interesting on the along under the PEXA, that's, uh, Finios, which is a software company in the insurance industry, you've got Domino's and the last one, Temple and Webster, which is uh, essentially run, running like an online retailing business in sort of the furniture area. They're all what we call the owner driver businesses. So the people that founded the companies are running it. So again, it's that repeat of the pattern we talked about where we look for patterns and characteristics of companies that we like. Interesting. Now we're going to jump to. Um... Mirabuka. Um, so I just wanted to, before we get through and back, um, there's the top 25 holdings uh, in AFI. Um, so just in terms of Mirabuka, Mirabuka is also a listed investment company, which Jeff mentioned at the start. Uh, as distinct from AFI, it specialises in small and medium-sized companies located within Australia and New Zealand. The company's been operating since April, 2000, uh, April 1999, big yours, and was listed on the ASX on the 28th of June 2001. Many small and medium-sized companies are listed on the ASX and Mirabuka seeks to invest in those companies that they believe offer attractive value. Of particular interest are companies with relatively low price-to-earnings ratios and high dividend yields. Often these companies have strong growth prospects and specialise in a range of attractive product, market and industry sectors. Benefits may also arise from takeover and merger activity, which is happening quite a bit at the moment. Now, um, we get to pump up the Mirabuka numbers as well. Since the 28th of June, 2021, a compound annual return of 12.7% per annum versus 7.2% for the index. I've used the small cap index, which I know is slightly different, but um, a good comparison nonetheless. 
That's a compound return of over a thousand percent versus only three hundred percent with the same level of risk for the index. So, um, with that, Kieran, first question: um, Can you talk about the attractiveness of investing in stocks outside the top fifty? And can you tell us how you keep Mark from investing in those parts of the market, uh, given that it is so attractive? <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Um, so I guess first to the, the the attraction. So I guess going back to what Mark was saying earlier, you know, it, when you identify a, a really high quality company and you've got many years ahead of, of above average growth rates, you get the full benefit of compounding. So the rewards, if you outside the fifty leaders, can be higher if you if you identify them earlier enough. Um, now, like a lot of things in 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 life, but investing applies as well. There's always a trade-off in that. So if you don't know what you're doing in this area of the market, the, the frequency and impact of getting them wrong can be greater. So you, you need to have expertise in really identifying what are the high quality companies and identifying at the right point in time and then owning them and backing them for the long term. And that's what uh, we think Mirabook has done particularly well over, over the years. Absolutely. And we sort of see that come through in terms of the long-term numbers here. So um, a little bit of a complex graph, but nonetheless, this is the rolling 10-year returns of the index um, and Mirabuka's performance over that time. And it's quite amazing here when you talk about making mistakes in this part of the market. And I guess that's reflected in the performance of the index. There are lots of stocks that don't perform so well in that part of the market. But if you can pick out good stocks and get it right, it can re reward you with long-term returns. Yeah, no, that's right. So, again, it is a it can be a complex chart, but as as you mentioned, Patrick, you know, having started in 1999, this just looks from 2009 when we had a 10 year track record at what that 10 year return had been if you'd been in the in the portfolio over that period of time. So, I guess the story for us is if you've been a 10 year investor in Mirabuki, you've had a range of outcomes of about eight percent per annum to the sort of 17 percent you're getting now. Um, and over all periods, you know, that's been, you know, the blue area on that chart shows you the, the outperformance against our benchmark. So that gives us confidence that the process works. And I guess perhaps just to elaborate on that, you know, Mark outlined the process earlier in terms of quality. Um, it is the same process for Mirabuka versus AFIC and all the funds we run. But when, you, when you're identifying early stage companies, you need to have a little bit more flexibility in how you're assessing that quality. And I guess that's where our experience, you know, seeing the key attributes these companies have, where we can see emerging quality. You know, if you look out five to 10 years, you can see that they're going to be the, the established leaders in the Australian market and, and they're giving those indicators from an early stage. And the other thing I would say is the, the advantage you get, I guess, doing what we do is, is the access to people. And that's the extra thing that we really lean on here, you know, with small companies, the smaller the company, the more critical the character motivations of those people is because they have a bigger impact, both to the positive and the negative. Um, so we have to spend a lot of time. We don't spend much time in spreadsheets. We spend a lot of time talking to people about their business. And, and that's how we, we invest in Mirabuka. Do you think it's harder or easier to invest in that part of the market, Kieran? I know that's sort of... A, a, a difficult question to answer, but you're seeing all these opportunities, these amazing opportunities. Does that make it easier or do you think it's easier to get it wrong or? Yeah, look, there's a couple of elements to that, Patrick. I mean, there's, you need to be disciplined. Um, you know, there's, we, we, we deal with a deluge of information and everyone's got a great idea for you. So you need to be able to say no to things and, and just accept that some of those are going to be good and you're going to have regrets from that. But if you, if you pick your way through it, um, you know, it's, it's not easy if you're not close to it. And, and I think the ability for us to really have people come and see us and to build a network of people around those businesses and really understand what's going on inside them, I'd never call it easy, but I think it gives us an ability to, you know, to have a track record that we're proud of, like you see on that slide. Yeah, and to go back a slide, you know, you must be really excited or, or pleased with the performance in recent times, um, you know, 33%. Um, for the benchmark versus 41% for the portfolio to 30 September, which is great. Um, I want to pick out a couple of stocks. <clears throat> we obviously spoke about ARB before, excuse me. Um, can you talk about Main Freight? Explain that business. That's certainly not a business many of our clients would be familiar with. So could you give us um, a little bit of a story behind that? 
Yeah, absolutely. You, you might have to cut me off and, and Mark will probably jump in because we could talk about this business for about you know five hours. We, we love it so like much. It's portfolios, it's, isn't it? It, it is. It's, and it's the, the biggest stock in Mirror Booker. And look, it, it, it really brings home some of the things we've been talking about particularly well, I think, because, you know, this, so just starting from what they do, it's a, it's a New Zealand domicile business that's in, in freight. Um, so servicing a lot of customers in um, food, beverage, consumer goods, um, starting from New Zealand, but they've branched out globally. And so, you know, you've got a bunch of warehouses and trucks and the initial, you know, screening of a stock like that is, well, how can that really be special? You know, how can you really have any competitive advantage? There's lots of competition, Customers always want the best price, but I've, I've had it described to me since that there's a bit of a cult element to, to main freight, which I think is probably a bit of a harsh word, but it's just this unbelievably unique culture where they they have an obsession with customer service. Um, and I've spent a lot of time actually going around operations with senior management, including the CEO, and you've just never seen people that are so fussy about the smaller details in the business. Um, and they therefore look for customers that really value that service. So they're not looking to, to ship anything for anyone. They're looking for that subset of customers that say, we'll pay a bit more to have things there on time and to have a really reliable partner in this area. And the other part of the culture that's it's, it's fascinating is they, they have a, I've never seen a company with such a culture of promotion with, from within. Um, you know, when people leave, there's always a, a line of successes in place and it's it's made a number of you know people uh, very wealthy over a long period of time as they've grown through the ranks of the business but it really gives that culture of autonomy getting the job done and being obsessed with the, the customer that's just achieved quite remarkable results over over many decades and, and we're confident that's got plenty in it yet and just to pick up on one of your earlier points Kieran about getting your hands dirty and getting out there and seeing these businesses. I guess you look at main freight in the spreadsheet and you think, yeah, okay, looks all right, but actually going out there and kicking the tires. I'm getting 100%. sick of using, I'm getting to, I'm over the puns this morning. I'll try not to use any more. I can tell you it's not deliberate. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's a perfect example, isn't it? No, a hundred percent, Patrick. And look, we, we get questions a lot, you know, and, and as it gets bigger in the portfolio, people sort of say, you know, you're sure, you know, that, that a company in that sector can be that special. And I guess we just keep meeting the company, keep seeing if there's anything changing, keep looking at the track record. And our answer is, is, is yes. You know, um, they've given us no reason to think otherwise. And, and actually to the contrary, that they've been really patiently building the same sort of business in very large US and European markets. And we're starting to get some indicators that those markets are now starting to see them win a bit more. So if that comes through, you can actually see growth rates accelerate for the group because of the size of those markets. Interesting. Uh, did you want to add anything to that, Mark? Or you're pretty oh, comfortable? I, 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 I could have won't, but again, it goes back to the, the CEO and the board all own a lot of stock. So you get that owner driver. Again, there's a pun, characteristic um, yep. um, as well. And the return on capital is very attractive. I think return on equity is in the high teens. So they can keep reinvesting in the business and make very high returns. And the market potential is massive. Interesting. Now, I'm going to pick out another one, Kieran, Pinnacle. It's a business that we're actually familiar with. Um, so could you explain the, the Pinnacle business and, and what it is that you like about it? Yeah, sure, Patrick. And again, I'll, it, it'll be familiar, but start with the people in the story. So in this case, Ian McCown is, is the founder of this business, and he's got a long track record his whole life's work in, in funds management. Um, and I guess what he really identified was that exceptional fund managers don't live very well in, in institutions like banks and large wealth management groups. Um, you know, that those really exceptional investors, they, wanted, they want independence, but at the same time, they need support and scale around that independence. So if you just start up an investment company, it's very hard to get the resources to go out and see all the people that you need to service in investing their money. But Pinnacle's model um, gives the best of both worlds in that they give you that support and they take co-equity ownership in these funds management businesses. So I think what Ian's really nailed in that model is, is the alignment from that. So the only way Pinnacle makes a profit is when it's, it's co-investing uh, fund managers are profiting. There's no sort of fee capture or anything on the way through. It's all fully aligned. And so 
We've seen them assemble a really good uh, stable of, of fund managers within that. There's across some the- unbelievable managers in there. Hyperion's part of a business that they own, which has been an amazing long-term performer. Absolutely. And clients would be familiar with the metrics business, which has performed unbel- in, uh, really well in the space that they're investing in. No, that's right, Patrick. And met- metrics is an interesting one because Pinnacle actually bought into that probably three years ago and, and it had a really good track record, really good investors in their space. But I think that was a really good demonstration of what I was talking about there with the support. You know, since it's been in the Pinnacle hands, you know, their ability to grow their business has, has stepped up you know, markedly. So that really, you know, shows the value they can add to these exceptional investors. You've never get, seen a bunch of guys get so excited about private debt in your whole entire life. <laughs> I can guarantee it. Absolutely. They absolutely love the stuff. You, once you get them started, they won't stop talking about it. Now, I want to talk about three I want, to, I want you to talk about three um, businesses that are recent portfolio additions, but I have to ask with Lark, Kieran, this hasn't been added because people are drinking more during COVID. <laughs> no, no, no. So this is, um, again, a fascinating one. So Tasmania is, is really coming onto the world stage you know, with a reputation for producing quality premium whiskey. So, look, I, I'm not an expert in this field, but you can see the reviews and the, the reputation building in that space. And I think the issue was, though, that there's a number of cottage players in that market that, you know, really the romance of producing whiskey was where their passion was. But running a business and and scaling it and putting it on the world stage, no one was unlocking that opportunity. So Jeff Bainbridge, you know, saw these characteristics. His background is um, grilled hamburgers. He was one of the, the, the founders of that chain. But he's an entrepreneur. He's been in a number of things and will continue to be. Um, he also had a background, sorry, before that with Fosters, um, you know, around the Asian market. So he knows the alcohol industry well as well. So he saw this great opportunity. He's gone down to Tasmania and just been exceptionally clever just in how he's he's brought this to market. You know, they're doing a lot of gifting, a lot of different areas of, of sales that they just never thought about. And the growth has been, been you know, remarkable really since he's arrived. So um, the, the other news, which I'd, I'd share, they... Today they just, or yesterday they announced an acquisition. So they bought a quite a fascinating property. If you if you have a look on online, it's a um, property called Sheen S H E N E in Pontville in uh, in Tasmania, just north of Hobart, and a remarkable site, which I think you know will accelerate this business to a new level, you know, giving them some scale and a real sort of banner um, property uh, that on a global stage will really play in well with the, with the brand. So, you know, a really interesting story. Another one that we're, we're very passionate about and things got really good upside uh, in the long term. And just quickly, the other two being tree and nanosonics. I've heard, I can't say I've heard of, of being tree. I have heard of nanosonics, Kieran. So just very briefly about those two. Yeah. So, so being tree is tiny. It's, it's capitalization is about $150 million. What, what they do is um, it's around data in the health space. So both in pathology businesses, but also in hospitals, looking to, to, to give those businesses better information around uh, things like their billing and error rates, but also really interestingly in areas like uh, infections and contamination within the hospital. So looking at how that, that patient contracted an issue, what what process they went through and being able to benchmark that against other hospitals. We think this is a really interesting area. There's data, value in data is growing in every industry um, and in healthcare, we think that that'll be no different. So from a very small start, we think um, good potential, but I would say, you know, still still at that early stage. So it has a bit of extra risk around it, but we think manageable risk for the portfolio. And um, Nanosonics, uh, they're more well-established. Uh, they uh, the global leader in um, contaminating ultrasound probes. So, uh, you know, they've got a great position in the US market there. Similar to what I was saying with ResMed, there's a machine, but they make really good margins out of the solution that treats those uh, ultrasound probes. The issue to date with this business is it's been a bit of a one trick pony around that product, but their reinvestment in research and development around broad up hospital infection uh, is really interesting. And they've just recently revealed details of a second product, which will be in, um, uh, sorry, completely uh, lost my train of thought. Sorry, I'll come, well, that's <laughs> come okay back to that. But well, yeah, now, but- just, no, just, that's just with those 
three businesses. This isn't deliberate, Kieran. I couldn't think of a more eclectic mix, alcohol and healthcare. It's almost a natural hedge, isn't it? No, that's right, Patrick. Well, and, and that goes to the point of um, characteristics. We don't have favoured industries. Um, you know, you look for people in those characteristics and you want a broad portfolio of exposure. So, um, so you, you manage that risk, you know, by doing that. I think we see this with the top 20 positions, Kieran. It is a very eclectic mix. It's, it's, it's hard to think of two businesses on that slide there that you could put as being peers or, or similar. I'm sure we could if we went through it in, in depth, but we've talked about Main Freight, we've talked about ARB and a couple of others there as well. So it is quite an eclectic mix of, of businesses. Yeah. Again, the, the, the link will be the backstory around the people um, and you know, and that, that ability to grow for the long term. That's similar. Yep. Now, testament to the patience of, of the stable of Afik and Mirabuka's investments uh, or investing. Jeff's been sitting there very, very patiently and he's had to bookend the presentation. And I've been watching him my screen. He certainly hasn't fallen asleep. He's, he's paid attention all the way through. Um, you obviously spoke about um, how listed investment companies work, Jeff, at the start. And we've mentioned the dividend story a little bit on the way through the presentation. But it's certainly one of the things that we find most attractive of investing in listed investment companies that have been around a long time, and that's the consistency of, of dividends. Yeah. So can you talk to us a little bit about the consistency of dividends for AFIC? Yeah, and so just, just going back to the structure, I mean, listed investment companies generate their income in really in two ways, the income that they get from the investments that they have, so the dividend pass-through, and also realise capital gains. So things sold in the portfolio for a profit uh, obviously generate realised capital gains that we can pass on as fully frank dividends. So the important part about the structure is really all the distributions are fully franked in the hands of investors. So they're in, in the hands of investors after tax. So you don't have to worry about managing other than getting the benefit of the, of the franking credits. In Africa's case, we like to produce stable and growing dividends over time. Uh, in Mirror Booker's case, we like to produce attractive, fully frank dividends from a market that doesn't generally produce strong, fully frank dividends in the small mid-cap space. In Africa's case, um, we've done that over a very long period, as Mark talked about earlier on, and we've been able, able to build up reserves because of past profits, past realised gains, particularly in large takeovers, which we haven't distributed all at once. So that has allowed us to provide consistency in dividends through very difficult times through the GFC, for example, as Mark talked about earlier on through the recent COVID um, uh, pan pandemic that we've had to, had to go through. In Mira Booker's case, it's a lot more active in terms of the portfolio because of the nature of that market, a lot more takeovers. They may sell things as much as Kieran tries not to sell things when valuations get to a point where they want to take a bit off the top, for example, just to get some income back into the portfolio. And in that context, Mirapook has paid a steady dividend of 10 cents per share over the long term, but it also has a record of paying special dividends as well. So if we get large takeovers, we always believe on we always believe that franken credits have better value in the hands of shareholders. So we try and get those best back as best we can for um, shareholders in Mirror Booker. In terms of both of those companies, they've got strong reserves, both in terms of uh, capital positions, but also in terms of franking. So again, we think the structure speaks to the attractiveness for, for long-term investors such as your clients. Yep, and you, and you know, we spend the time to look through the balance sheets of each of the, the companies. Jeff, and you can, you can see that with the retained profits and frankings yeah. that there's that there's quite ample sort of reserves there to pay dividends and, and franking. Yeah, credits and, and we know it's important for shareholders who like income, clearly. And consistency of income to plan their retirement or pre-retirement, pre yeah. Absolutely. Now, um, we've got a couple of charts here which will link to our, our final question. So thank thanks all you guys for your time today. We really appreciate it. Um, the hardest part of the presentation when we've got to get our crystal balls out um, and make predictions um, we don't come back in 12 months and penalise you for bad predictions, but we've obviously got a couple of charts here in terms of price to book and price to sales, and then we can sort of see how strong the market has been. So, um, and I don't care in what order or, you know, who does it first, but um, just a sort of view looking forward for markets and the portfolios, Mark, maybe you could start. Yeah, well, look, um, <clears throat> this is probably the area I can have the most confidence about, and that's that you know, I've been doing this for quite a few years and I can tell you with a great deal of confidence that I have no idea where markets are going over the next <laughs> few months or 12 months. All I know is that 
over long-term periods, I'm talking about 5, 10, 15, 20 years, the market's a good place to be in equities because the market is just an aggregation of businesses and businesses are an aggregation of assets and people all constantly striving to produce superior returns. So it's a good place to be. From that chart, though, we, we did highlight back in March after the market had fallen, we did a shareholder briefing saying we'd got no idea where markets are going. But from a historical perspective, and we put a, a, like a 60-year chart and we highlighted all the um, events that had caused, mar caused markets to fall, and we said this just looks like another one of those, and inevitably it's being a buying opportunity. And we sort of, could have called that out and we were buying in our portfolios and that sort of played out. And again, there was no great magic in that. It was just looking at history repeating itself. Um, but look, from where we see now, you can see that those price to sales is completely reversed. They're now right at the top of the trading range. But again, I'd put a caveat. It doesn't mean I'm saying market's going to collapse. You can get an adjustment in price simply by markets can go sideways. Um, but we also are conscious though that interest rates are still very low. So you would expect some sort of valuation metrics to be higher than what they used to be five to 10 years ago. But yeah, look, we were chatting before, but it feels like, you know, the market's had a pretty good run. Um, multiples are higher than historically. So we're, we're probably just say we're more cautious now. We've got the stocks lined up, we want to buy, but it's not our style to try and, I think, trying to predict markets and, you know, working out when to buy and sell, it's it's too hard for me. I can't do it. All we can do is try and find what are the good companies, be ready. And when we see pullback and dips, keep adding them to our portfolios, keep weeding out the ones gradually that we think have run, run their course. Um, and beyond that, it's very difficult to try and predict this. But there's lots of stuff going on, with, you know, with in, there's fears of inflation, um, there's also some fears that growth is starting to slow a little bit, um, but this is all just noise. We got a we have a you know a focus on the businesses, and we listen to the companies and what they're doing, and that's our focus. Mark, it's a guilty pleasure of mine to make stock pickers make predictions for the for the market. So I do enjoy doing it. Kieran, <laughs> well, I got you... no idea. So <laughs> that's, that's yeah, good look, to know. I'd probably just add a, a little bit. Um, of perspective just around the mirror book of portfolio Patrick that we did try and share at our recent AGM and that's just um, we, we've had a remarkable run on the short term you know the, the track record of stocks performing spectacularly well over the last 12 months and the number of which did you know that that's inevitably going to need to be cycled in the short term so we just want to make sure that people that are looking at mirror booker continue to look at us on a long-term view and our confidence around our long-term prospects you know, as strong as they've been, but just just be mindful that you know it's had a particularly good run in the short term. So so keep that perspective going forward. Good, thanks, guys. Guys, really appreciate your time today. All three of you joining us, our clients and guests greatly appreciate it. Stay safe and well, and we hope to see you all and speak to you all again soon. Take care. Okay, thanks, Brad. Thank you. Thank you, Tom.